The following presentation was recorded at the 24th Annual International Conference on the Management of the Tinnitus and Hyperacusis Patient. This video is being made available with permission from the American Tinnitus Association and with permission from the University of Iowa. All right, quick show of hands. How many of you have never heard of visual snow syndrome until today? Okay, that's almost everybody, which means that's a good thing because we're all gonna learn something new. And how many of you are currently wondering what in the world a topic like this could possibly have to do with tinnitus? Okay, good, because I was wondering the exact same thing when I was in your shoes. Well, my purpose here today is to try uh, informing you of three things that you might find interesting about visual snow syndrome in relationship to tinnitus. And my hope is that this information will provide valuable to either researchers, practitioners, or patients that are wanting to more, know more about the neuroscience of tinnitus and possibly how to manage these symptoms. But first, we need to begin with a quick story. So February 7th, 2014 was a pretty normal Friday for me. I spent my day at work essentially writing software and analyzing data. And that evening I had some dinner and drinks with a few friends. Everything was pretty normal except for the fact that I had a little bit of a, a headache in my right temple, but it didn't really hurt, so I didn't think much of it. And I went to bed relatively early and got a good night's sleep. So all in all, it was a pretty normal day. In fact, pretty normal week for that matter. However, when I woke up the following morning, I noticed that I had quite a bit of brain fog, general difficulty, concentrating, reasoning, and, and thinking in general. And I just assumed that it was a bit groggy in the morning, so I didn't think much of it. As I got out of bed and got ready for the day, I also noticed that I had this, uh, this tingling sensation that was throughout my entire body, mostly noticeable in my hands and feet. I assumed I was probably just coming down with some kind of weird cold or flu, so I just kind of blew it off and, and laid low for the rest of the day. The next day, however, I woke up and I noticed that I had a continuous ringing in both of my ears. And now, this seemed a bit weird since I hadn't been exposed to any like, high, level, or high volume noises in the previous day. As I opened my eyes, though, I noticed that my entire field of vision had this, this static or this noise about it. It was uh, like looking at everything through a slightly static analog television. And now, this really started to concern me, so I set up an appointment with my general practitioner for the following day. Over the next few days, I noticed a series of other odd uh, visual, auditory, and tactile phenomena. First, I'd rarely ever seen a floater in my entire life, other than in rare lighting conditions. However, I was now seeing floaters in my entire vision, and it was in normal lighting conditions as well. In addition, I started seeing after images of objects, even against low contrast backgrounds. Essentially the same thing as if you were to stare at this image for a few seconds and then look away, except I would see the after images with everything, essentially after looking at them for just a fraction of a second. I also noticed these bright speckles that would zigzag in my vision anytime I'd look at any uh, solid contrast background, uh, specifically like a, a blue background. And uh, they're the same ones that you see if you stand up too fast or if you get hit in the head, but uh, these didn't go away and they, um, I, I couldn't not see them. They were just always there. About a dozen or so other consistent symptoms emerged over the course of the next week, including visual symptoms like a constant vibration to all the text as I was reading it, uh, trailing positive after images in addition to the negative after images, difficulty with bright sunlight, uh, more difficulty than usual seeing at night, and halos around all bright lights at night as well. Other auditory symptoms like uh, semi-loud noises were uh, annoyingly loud now, difficulty isolating a single person's voice in background conversations or with uh, background noise, difficulty blocking out environmental noises as well while I was working, and this weird noise in my ear that would happen every time there was an abrupt change in volume levels. Other tactile symptoms like a re reoccurring localized buzzing uh, pulsating sensation that would occur in my arms, legs, and sometimes thighs, and something that felt like tiny muscle tremors like all over my body, but usually in my hands and my feet, and various other symptoms like fatigue, irritability, and more. All of the symptoms persisted except for the brain fog, which thankfully went away after a few days. My general practitioner ran the standard battery of tests and everything came back normal. He said he wasn't even sure if he should send me to an audiologist, a neurologist, an ophthalmologist, or some other allergist. So he ran out of ideas and eventually suggested that I contact the Mayo Clinic to see if they could help. I spent two weeks at the Mayo Clinic getting dozens of tests from some of the top specialists in the US. They said I had a bit of dry eye because it was an unusually dry winter in 2014. Uh, I had some high frequency hearing loss, which seemed relatively normal given my background. I had a bit of gastrointestinal distress from all the stress that I was under, not knowing what was wrong with me. And I had a bit of situational anxiety as well too, because I still had no idea what was wrong with me. However, all of my tests, including a full MRI, came back completely normal. Eventually, they concluded that my symptoms were most likely the result of something that they referred to as a central sensitization disorder. 
Central sensitization is an upregulation of specific sensory input in the central nervous system, which leads to a hypersensitivity of sensory stimulus. They see it most commonly in chronic neuropathic pain patients, like people with fibromyalgia. However, in my case, it appeared to be creating a hypersensitivity in my vision, hearing, and my sense of touch as well. They didn't know what caused it, there was no known cure for it, so they suggested that I reduce my stress, I eat healthy, I get to regular exercise, take a yoga class, and maybe learn how to meditate. They also strongly encouraged that I take anti-anxiety medication uh, temporarily, which I begrudgingly eventually took, in order to prevent my situational anxiety from potentially growing into something worse, like a generalized anxiety disorder. Then, just start learn how to, or learn how to manage my symptoms, wait it out, and see if things improve over time. I started researching central sensitization in preparation for developing my recovery plan. While doing so, I stumbled upon an article released about a month earlier that was called Visual Snow, a, a Disorder Distinct from Persistent Migraine with Aura. This article discussed a rare neurological condition referred to as visual snow. The article described visual snow as continuous tiny dots in the entire visual field similar to the noise of an analog television. And now this sounded really familiar to me, as you can imagine. The article also went on to describe visual snow syndrome, which is a cluster of symptoms found highly prevalent in patients that present with visual snow. And these symptoms include palinopsia, seeing after images, increased entoptic phenomena, like seeing an unusual amount of floaters in your vision, bright zigzagging specks across blue backgrounds, photophobia, which is difficulty dealing with bright lights, uh, nyctalopia, which is difficulty with night vision, and surprisingly, continuous bilateral non-pulsate tinnitus. Now, I was essentially reading a list of symptoms that almost perfectly described exactly what I'd been experiencing for the last few months. The following month, a second article on visual snow was published in another medical journal by the same lead researchers. This article attempted to provide objective evidence using functional brain imaging that visual snow syndrome was in fact a real, objectively measurable disease. In addition, that it was a distinct disorder from migraine, migraine with aura, psychogenic disorders, post-hallucinogen perception disorders, and other diseases with similar symptoms. The most important finding was the observation that areas of the brain were more metabolically active in the PET scans of 17 patients with visual snow compared to the healthy control subjects. The two areas of hypermetabolism were the right lingual gyrus, which is involved with visual memory and higher order functions of vision, and the anterior lobe of the left cerebellum, adjacent to the left lingual gyrus, whose key function for vision as we currently understand it is extraocular motility. So you might be asking yourself right now, you know, why is this important and what does this have to do with tinnitus? To answer that question, first, we need to take a look at a list of the symptoms associated with visual snow and their statistical prevalence. The first item of interest is the high prevalence of patients that present with both visual snow and tinnitus. In the first study of 78 patients with visual snow, 62% reported also having continuous bilateral non-pulsate tinnitus. In the second study, which is expanded to 120 patients, 64% reported tinnitus. And now this seemed like a pretty interesting coincidence to me. Even more interesting was the fact that these symptoms seemed to manifest themselves as noise and sensory modalities, or at least increased sensitivity to sensory stimulus, which would make the noise more prevalent. Where things got really interesting was a study that came out this year. The article presented a hypothesis that would potentially explain uh, how both visual snow syndrome and tinnitus are related by a common pathophysiological mechanism, specifically a thalamocortical dysrhythmia secondary dysfunctional to dysfunctional neuronal excitability and impaired habituation response. Coincidentally, this study also found that 63% of its 32 visual snow patients also had tinnitus as well. Now, the details of this hypothetical model are a bit too complex to discuss in the limited amount of time we have, and I'm honestly not qualified to discuss them anyways. However, the model proposes neurobiologically plausible connections between all the visual symptoms, migraine, tinnitus, fine tremor, and several other symptoms as well. In addition, if this hypothetical model is correct, visual snow syndrome should, in theory, be objectively measurable by a second brain imaging technique referred to as magnetoencephalography, or MEG. This is because the lamocortical dysrhythmia has been objectively observed using MEG in patients suffering from neurogenic pain, tinnitus, Parkinson's disease, and depression. Thus, if confirmed, this hypothesis would provide a neurobiologically plausible connection to explain the high correlation between visual snow syndrome uh, symptoms and tinnitus symptoms. In addition, it adds evidence that conscious awareness of tinnitus, or at least some subtypes of tinnitus, may share a common underlying cause with several other neurological conditions. This has led to some very interesting research, theoretical research, I should add, uh, on thalamocortical dysrhythmia in re relation to tinnitus, such as this article in Frontiers of Neurology from last summer. While the research is still theoretical, it could provide a new model for understanding tinnitus and how it operates from a neuroscientific perspective. 
More importantly, this new understanding may someday lead to rational treatments for tinnitus and other disorders believed to be associated with flammocortical dysrhythmias like visual snow, uh, neurogenic pain, and Parkinson's as well. While there's clearly some interesting research happening in both visual snow syndrome and tinnitus these days, it will still likely be many years before we have a full understanding, if we ever do have a full understanding, uh, which will lead to methods for effectively treating these conditions. So what can be done in the meantime to manage these symptoms? Well, I, let me start by being very open and honest with you, and this makes me a bit vulnerable, uh, by saying I did not do a very good job at all with dealing with my symptoms initially. In fact, I, I really struggled with it. Bothersome tinnitus is tough enough, but imagine having the same uh, noise in both your vision and your tactile sensation as well, too, and you've essentially got a recipe for disaster. My struggle with managing bothersome symptoms led to considerable stress, anxiety, sleep issues, difficulty concentrating at work, and eventually a bit of depression as well, too. To be completely honest, things were not looking good at all for me. However, the Mayo Clinic armed me with the tools that I needed in order to build a, uh, develop a plan to eventually learn how to manage my symptoms. And now, please keep in mind that I'm not here to either endorse or condone any specific form of treatment or a, a method of managing symptoms. I'm just telling you my own personal experience of what worked for me with my specific set of symptoms. First, I was able to identify factors that made my symptoms worse. My symptoms still exist, even to this day, 24 seven. However, certain things make them noticeably worse. In, they are, in order of uh, most to least aggravating, uh, too much stress, like getting ready to give a presentation in front of a group of people, uh, lack of sleep, uh, cold, or cold or flu, essentially having a cold or flu makes things worse, uh, alcohol, or more specifically, the hangover that follows the alcohol, caffeine, too much sodium, and too much sugar as well. So I tried to eliminate these factors as much as reasonably possible to keep my symptoms in check. To do so, I changed up my diet to eliminate the things that made my symptoms worse. In addition, I was also trying to eat healthy food, stuff that would make my body and brain uh, keep it healthy while it was trying to recover. I increased my physical exercise as well, and this helped tremendously with managing stress, anxiety, and depression as well. In fact, this is a photo of me after my first 100-mile bike ride last year, and I'm working on my first 150-mile bike ride this summer. I also started practicing yoga as well. And now this was extremely helpful for me, in fact, even more so than exercise uh, for managing both the stress and anxiety. Yoga teaches you how to calm your sympathetic nervous system, that is your fight or flight response, and it does this by intentionally activating the sympathetic nervous system through, the, through motion and through physical exertion, and then teaching you to calm it back down using breath awareness and mental focus as well. In fact, yoga has been so helpful for me that I now do between, between two to four hours of yoga each week just because I feel so good after I do it. What has helped me the most with managing my symptoms, though, is meditation. Meditation, like yoga, teaches you how to calm your sympathetic nervous system in the face of painful uh, or pleasurable physical, um, mental, or emotional sensations. And it does this through focused awareness of breath and through monitoring of thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations. In addition, it helps with concentration, maintaining non-judgment, and minimizes cravings and aversions as well. However, this took the right instruction, quite a bit of time, and a lot of work in order to teach my brain these new, brain these new beneficial habits. Now, I think it's very important to note that I am a very rational and scientific person. I don't subscribe to any new age beliefs, mysticism, or any of that quantum flapdoodle. So, <laughs> I was quite skeptical about yoga and meditation first, even after several experts at the Mayo Clinic had recommended it to me. However, over time, I learned that there's actually quite a bit of strong scientific evidence from reputable sources that meditation, when done properly, can have tremendous benefits for managing chronic bothersome symptoms like pain or tinnitus. In addition, there's very strong evidence to support that there are numerous other benefits for stress, anxiety, and depression as well. In fact, I could easily talk for several hours on the topic of uh, mindfulness and meditation if you guys would let me, but um, unfortunately, due to limited times and attention span, um, I'm just gonna show you a bit of my own empirical evidence to support these claims. So every morning when I do my daily meditation, I connect myself to a biofeedback device. Um, it connects via my fingertips. It measures galvanic skin response, also known as electrodermal response. That's this right here. So galvanic skin response works as a, a reasonably good measure of sympathetic nervous system activation. This also tells us about the opposite state of affairs too, which is called homeostasis, or the body's natural resting state. I collect these data from my meditation sessions each morning so that I can analyze them using statistical analysis software, like the programming language R. On the x-axis, we have time, starting from my first meditation session after the Mayo Clinic, all the way until today. And on the y-axis, we have the galvanic skin response, the average galvanic skin res response from each meditation session. The data points in blue here represent the meditation sessions before I took a 10-day course on meditation to learn how to properly meditate. 
The data points start out low because of the anti-anxiety medication that they prescribed me at the Mayo Clinic. It lowers the sympathetic nervous system. But as they gradually tapered me off, you can see that my sympathetic nervous system or my stress response continues to uh, get worse. The data points in red, however, are after I took a 10-day course on meditation. Now, during these 10 days, they taught me how to meditate according to the Vipassana tradition of meditation. In addition, uh, in those 10 days, I had to confront my symptoms 24-7 without any distractions, no TV, no computer, no cell phone, uh, and learn how to maintain equanimity in response to uh, these constant symptoms. And as you can see, this is pretty much a night and day difference between uh, how I was able to handle my symptoms before and after I learned how to meditate correctly or properly. So while I realize this is just a case study of one, I hope that this might help uh, convince some of you that there is something worth uh, researching further about using mindfulness practices like meditation and yoga to manage uh, chronic bothersome symptoms like tinnitus. So for me, mindfulness practices like yoga and meditation have been extremely helpful in uh, helping me to learn how to turn my bothersome symptoms into manageable symptoms. In addition, it might sound counterintuitive, but I now honestly believe that it is possible to be in physical, emotional, or mental pain, to, but, but not to be suffering from it. Because suffering is essentially how our mind responds to that pain. And uh, while I still have to deal with these symptoms every day, I'm very happy to report that I'm no longer suffering from my symptoms anymore. So if you're interested in learning any more about the topics we discussed today, I have links to all of the articles that we discussed on visual snow, in addition to thalamocortical dysrhythmia and its possible relationship to tinnitus. In addition, future research is currently happening as we speak. The lead researchers who created the first two studies on visual snow syndrome have recently completed a third study, which the results should be released in the next few uh, weeks or months. In addition, they're also attempting to spin up a fourth study that will involve more brain imaging. However, they're currently trying to secure the funding necessary to do so. It's unfortunate that um, there aren't a whole lot of people with visual snow syndrome, so there aren't a whole lot of people interested in researching this or providing funding for the research. So all four of these studies have been largely funded by a small number of individuals, like me, uh, who either have visual snow syndrome or know people that do. So if you're interested in helping push this research forward, uh, please consider making a donation to the uh, Ion Vision Foundation using the URL below. Uh, it's a legitimate tax-exempt uh, organization, and all the research goes to visual snow syndrome. And while I may not be suffering from visual snow anymore, or suffering from the symptoms, uh, there are still a lot of other people that are, so they could definitely use your help. Finally, if you're interested in learning more about mindfulness and meditation, the best source of academic information I've found on the subject is a video lecture series by Professor Ron Siegel from Harvard University called The Science of Mindfulness. It contains 12 hours of information on what we currently know about mindfulness and meditation from a purely scientific perspective. However, if you're interested in learning how to practice meditation, the best thing I can recommend is taking a 10-day course on Vipassana meditation. You'll spend up to 12 hours uh, a day for 10 days learning how to meditate properly in an ideal learning environment. It's completely non-religious. There's no weird stuff. Uh, everyone's super nice. The food's actually really good. And it's all based on a pay-it-forward system. So if you don't find any value from it yourself, you actually don't owe them anything. But you can pay to have other people come after you. It's essentially like a, a boot camp for building really good habits for your mind. So, in conclusion, I hope we've learned at least three things today of interest about visual snow syndrome in regard to tinnitus. First, we demonstrate that visual snow syndrome and tinnitus are related in the sense that approximately 63% of patients with visual snow also have tinnitus. And this should be of interest because it may point to common underlying neurobiological causes for both visual snow and tinnitus, or at least some subtypes of tinnitus. Second, we demonstrated that research into visual snow syndrome is providing novel insight into tinnitus as well. And this has created additional evidence to support new explanatory models for tinnitus, like the thalamocortical dysrhythmia model. And third, it is possible to manage both visual snow syndrome and tinnitus symptoms, at least for me specifically it was, uh, through the use of diet, exercise, and mindfulness practices like yoga and meditation. And I hope that my story might serve as inspiration to other people that either research, care for, or suffer from other bothersome uh, symptoms like these. Finally, if you only take one thing away from this presentation today, let it be this, that it is possible to be in physical, mental, or emotional pain, but to not be suffering from it. This is because suffering is how we respond to that pain. Thank you. Is that good? Thank you to the following organizations and individuals for making this presentation possible. The American Tinnitus Association, the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, the Management of the Tinnitus and Hyperacusis Patient Conference, Richard Tyler, Phil Gander, Scott Mitchell, Torn Brazel, and Melanie West.